piercing the Himalayan sky, a forbidding monolith of rock, snow, and ice. Raw, unyielding, K2, the savage mountain. More deadly than Everest, K2 seduces the best climbers on Earth. Some will reach the summit. Many will die. These are their stories. It doesn't have to be do or die to get to the top. It's the whole process and the journey and the experience. This path that you follow, you know, raising money and putting the team together and collecting the equipment, sending it over to Pakistan, is all a very important part of the road that you're traveling. The, the top is ephemeral. It's gone in an instant, but it's what you do to get there. The second highest mountain in the world, K2 is also among the most remote. Yet for climbers, the challenge of getting there is part of the allure. From the first day of planning to the mountain's highest slopes, it is the journey of a lifetime. All in the quest for K2. Since explorers first reached this far-off mountain, only the most daring have ventured here. The journey demands years of careful planning and begins with cold, hard cash. The cost of mounting expeditions to K2 in the 1970s ranged from two to three hundred thousand dollars a year and none of us none of us had those kind of funds available to us personally so you have to go out and find the money it says right here how much we need if you add it up an estimate of, of the the camel weight that we're going to pick up in cash car and this should pop out even small teams like the american k2000 must seek funding from a variety of sources. All right, they import the 19% border mandatory bribe. That's for consumers. Um, it's actually going to be less than 16K. But we have $3,380 from the for tents now that we have to pay for. And the jugs. Yeah, yeah, they're great. The porters like the containers. Seven tons of supplies will be needed for just 12 climbers. These things are bulky. Everything from medicine to matches must be carried on the journey. A simple oversight could cost the climbers the summit, or even their lives. Our budget for land expenses was 165,000. Um, it's actually gone up to about 185,000. With gear, though, the actual budget is more like 250,000. We need the sponsors to make it happen. What about, and are these uh, only goggles? It says access grant, and what that's telling you is your battery's full and that we don't have a signal at all yet. A mountaineering yeah. website is a major expedition sponsor. It'll take a second, it's saying searching all regions. These days, you know, with the satellite phone technology and the emails and, and digital photos that you can, you know, send, that's an integral part of the whole funding process. It's turning what we do now almost into a spectator event. Digital still, this is going to be your video camera. And what basically it does... The Internet helps them rally support and publicity. Uh, uh, video on the fly. And later will bring daily so updates to the world via satellite. And the lines intersect at where you are on the globe, and okay. it tells you what the magnetic heading and what the elevation needs to be for the antenna. Elevation meaning the angle? Exactly. I love the challenge and the struggle of trying to find sponsors, but I think the thing that I really like the most is actually traveling through the country that the mountain belongs in.
Islamabad, the capital of Pakistan. The journey here has brought many climbers thousands of miles from home. But K2 still lies more than 600 miles and many weeks away. There is little time for sightseeing. Permits must be finalized, vehicles hired, and food supplies stocked. To balance the basic diet of rice and lentils, expeditions buy as much fresh food as they can carry. From Islamabad, the journey grows more arduous by the day, yet weaves its own compelling magic spell. The Karakoram Highway follows a part of the ancient Silk Route. Here, treasured cloth and spices traveled west, while gold and ivory traveled east. Beyond the highway, unpaved roads wind through the harsh, remote villages of the Balti people. The inhabitants of Baltistan, also known as Little Tibet, migrated to the Karakoram some 600 years ago. They live mainly off the land, as they have for centuries. These farmers and shepherds supplement their income by working as mountain guides, cooks, and porters. Not all routes to K2 go through Pakistan. From the north side, teams enter through China. The journey through Qingsheng province is a test of patience and endurance. Slow camel caravans transport expeditions through vast stretches of wilderness. When the weather warms and glaciers thaw, the rivers can become nearly impassable. It's right in the summertime and it's warm and the, the snow is melting and running off and the river becomes very swollen and the, it's too deep to wade, so you're trapped there. You can't get out. I mean, there aren't very many places in the world that are like that now. For climbers who choose the northern route, the risks are worth the reward. A chance to conquer the mountain's treacherous north face. After weeks of hard travel, the first sight of K2 astonishes even the most seasoned mountaineer. Suddenly we saw mountain and we stayed like 30 minutes and keep silence. They was shocked how it's giant. It's scared because it's the size, the scale is enormous. If you imagine that you need to climb this route many days, no, unbelievable. Even for experienced climb. June 1975. After months of fundraising and planning, an American expedition was finally in Pakistan. Their goal, to be the first from the United States to summit K2.
the Americans hired 600 local Balties to work as porters. From here to the mountain, the Balties would be critical to the team's success. By law, each man was paid the equivalent of $4 a day. In two months, they would earn more than in a year of farming. Fourteen Balties were given higher pay and the same equipment and clothing as the climbers for the more skilled and dangerous work of high altitude porters. Balties are the backbone of the expeditions. They literally haul all the tons and tons of gear it takes to mount an expedition. They leave their fields and their families during the most important harvesting times of the year to ferry foreigners up to the base camps. The work is fairly new to the Balties. When the foreigners first started coming, more in the 50s to 70s, it changed their life a lot. They started having to interact with outsiders who they're very unfamiliar with and engaging in trade and carrying loads. In 1975, the massive loads brought by the Americans meant a windfall for the Balties. We basically tried to take Seattle to K2 with us, uh, and I think we learned a lot. Uh, we learned that we didn't need canned goods. We didn't need 200 bottles of oxygen. It was just absurd to have that much equipment with us. We had to hire five, 600 porters to carry all this equipment into the mountain. And of course, you've got to hire porters to carry the food for the porters who are carrying your equipment. And it's almost a endless regress. Day after day, the human conveyor belt wound its way through the Braldu Valley. At Herdukas, the team had already walked miles across the glacier that leads to K2. Without warning, many of the porters refused to go any farther, demanding higher pay. With only 20 miles to go, the expedition was about to fall apart. The most serious strike that we had at Urtikos, where the porters were saying they weren't going on and they were turning around. Lou Whitaker pulled out a rupee note and held it in the air and said, if you don't carry for us, we're not getting to this mountain, we fail, and you're not gonna get paid anything, even for the days that you've worked. Uh, if we fail, you fail. We'll burn all the money. And he took a lighter and lit the rupee note, left it on the negotiating table, and turned around, and we all walked away. And they watched that burning rupee note, thought about it, and within five minutes, uh, we had a deal for them to keep carrying. But many more strikes would follow. Hundreds of porters deserted or were fired. It had been nearly two months since the Americans arrived in Pakistan. Long delays, illness, and divisions between the climbers fueled a growing sense of defeat. We could see that our, our total time was being taken away, that our resources, our money, our food, everything else were being drained.
By the time the team caught the first glimpse of K2, the journey had already taken a serious toll. At the end of the long trek, all teams converge at base camp. A temporary United Nations for nearly a century. As they are climatized to high altitude and set up higher camps, climbers may leave base camp and return several times before their final summit attempt. Base camp is, it's your haven. When you come down off the mountain, it's a place for you to completely relax and forget about what you're doing up on the hill. It's a place for you mentally and physically to recover. There's more oxygen there, the food's better, you know, you usually have somebody cooking three meals a day for you, whereas on the mountain you're eating like a bird. Sometimes uh, you, you must have more, more strength to wait and then to... At base camp, climbers debate strategies for their ascent. Oh, yeah. No, I'm by no means saying that this group has to go. The first stage will be to ferry equipment to set up higher camps. They need tents, food and fuel, thousands of feet of rope, and specialized gear for snow and ice. Now, the ultimate journey begins to the summit of K2, more than 28,000 feet high. The Porter strikes were over the grueling trek behind them. The 1975 American team was finally ready for the assault on K2. Our plan was to establish a series of camps beyond base camp that would enable us to build a pyramid of supplies that would permit two or more members of the team to, to make an attempt on the summit. If successful, they would be the first team in history to ascend K2 by the Northwest Ridge. The flanks were so steep and icy, supplies had to be winched up to the second camp. Then, a series of storms trapped them in camp. Tensions mounted. Nerves grew frayed. When they finally attempted the ridge, twice the mountain forced them back. The top of the, the ridge that went over these series of pinnacles was double corniced, so there was just a very dangerous hanging snow. We got onto a knife edge ridge that might have been possible for very top alpinists moving light with uh, fairly light packs to go across once. And while it might be possible to climb along that ridge, uh, we felt that it would be impossible to have a climber who got into trouble, sick or injured, to get someone back across that pinnacled ridge to safety. That's it. The, the expedition is basically over. We've, we've only reached 22,000 feet, and there's the summit up there, 6,000 feet above us. Nowhere close. Jim Wickwire and Lou Whitaker would return in 1978 to attempt a different route. But the 1975 American expedition, perhaps doomed from the start, was over. 
So even as it turned out, if the mountain had not got the best of us in 1975 with the route we were trying, which I think could easily be called an impossible route, uh, if that hadn't happened, uh, if we hadn't had the, the storms that certainly affected our, our progress on the mountain, I think the split in the team and the disharmony would have ultimately produced the same result. It was a, a harsh lesson to come away from that first expedition to K2, having gone there with such high hopes. All who brave K2 are driven by a singular dream, to stand in glory on the summit. Fewer than 200 have made it. Hundreds of others have tried and failed. But beyond the mountain, many discover rewards of a very different kind. For Greg Mortensen, the trip to K2 led to a final chapter that has amazed even him. In 1993, Mortensen tried to summit K2 and failed, too weak and depleted to go on. I was emotionally and physically exhausted. Two porters, Musafer and Jakub, from a local village near K2, helped me off the mountain from base camp back to their village. This is about a seven-day walk. Mortensen wanted to give something back to the people who had given so freely to him. He found that the village had many children, but no school. I felt that it would just, it wouldn't take very much to build a school, and that would be a little I could do in return for all that they had done for me. I sold all my climbing gear, I sold my car, I cashed in my retirement policy with the University of California so that I had more money for this school. But I was still short about $10,000. With a last minute donation, Mortensen's vision came to life and flourishes even today. In only four years since the first school was done in 96, we've been able to do 104 projects, which includes 12 schools. We're supporting 19 schools. Over 1,900 children are being educated that didn't have a chance before. I think what Greg Mortensen has done with the Central Asia Institute for K2 is amazing. In a way, I think he's become the patron saint of K2 in the way that Everest and the Sherpas had Sir Edmund Hillary to set up all the schools and clinics. Uh, Greg Mortensen has done the same for K2 and the surrounding communities. For Mortensen and many other climbers, the most rewarding memories are found not on the summit of K2, but among the people and the land that surround it. Like Mortensen, Galen Rowell never reached the summit, but the journey itself transformed him. I realized that if I failed on a mountain, I'd still had a wonderful wilderness experience. And when I took up photography, if I could bring back photographs that were meaningful, whether the climb succeeded or failed, those were memorable and important to me. So I don't view a failure on a mountain as a personal failure. I view it as an opportunity to have a wilderness experience. Going to K2 in 1975 radically changed my life. Since then, I've been to the Himalaya almost 30 times. I've been back to the Karakoram a total of nine times. I love open vistas, and I love open ground where you can see the bones of the earth, see it spread out in front of you, see firm granite running up to the summits, and to be in the Karakoram each time I come back is it's just a renewing experience that here is a place that is 
so wild and so remote and so uninhabited that uh, during my lifetime, and I hope during the lifetime of my children and grandchildren, it will be unchanged and that they can have the same kind of experiences uh, that I've had. The path to K2 begins with a vision and a dream. The summit is fleeting, but the gifts of the journey live on. The path, not the mountain, remains the enduring prize.